and good morning, WPA. I've been looking forward to uh, coming and being with you today. And uh, as it happens, I'm not actually with you in person. We're with you online, and it's great to be able to have this opportunity. Uh, Pastor Chris, thank you for mentioning our ministry. And, uh, you know, after pastoring for about 30 years, we have found ourselves involved in this ministry to Israel. And if you want to know more about that, uh, you can go to our website. I believe that uh, we'll have that up on the screen for you, firstcenturyfoundations.com. And, uh, or you can follow us on social media. And so we just encourage you to do that. Uh, just a little about me. I am married to Sharon, and uh, 32 years now she has been putting up with me, and we really enjoy being involved in this ministry together. We have two great kids, Austin and Alana. Austin is married to Amanda. They live near us in the city of Barrie, Ontario, and uh, they have given us two wonderful gifts in uh, our grandchildren, Addison and Abel. Our daughter, Daughter, Alana works in tourism in Collingwood, Ontario, and she is uh, living with us currently. We're sad not to be able to get together all together as a family this weekend, but we're going to make the best of it as I know that many of you are, and uh, this is the world that we're living in right now, right? So, Good Friday, Good Friday. We gather every year at this time for uh, what seems to be this solemn occasion. We gather to remember the crucifixion of Jesus, and the death that he suffered on a cruel cross at the hands of the Romans, spurred on by an angry Jewish mob, I suspect some of the same people who just a few days before had been waving palm branches and welcoming him into the city, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. How things can turn, how things can change. And this became an awful day. A day of torture and suffering and agony and death. So why do we call it good? You know, I like the uh, old BC comic that resurfaces every year around this time. And the one guy says, you know, I, I hate the term Good Friday. And so the other guy asks him, he says, well, why? First guy says, well, my Lord was hanged on a tree that day. The second guy says back to him, he says, well, what about this? What if you were going to be hanged on the tree and he volunteered to take your place? Then how would you feel? The first guy says, good. The second guy says to him, have a nice day. And he walks away. This morning, I'm not going to talk a lot about the day itself. I'm uh, not going to key in on all of that. Most, if not all of us, know that Jesus died a horrible death on the cross to save us from our sins. But what I want to remind us today is that this was not an event that took God the Father or His Son Jesus by surprise. This was a day that was planned from the very foundations of the world, a plan born in the heart of God that would show the world His love in such a powerful way that it should never be questioned, a plan that would see His one and only Son sacrificed for the sins of the world. And so intricate was this plan that God not only thought of it before creation, 1 Peter 1 and 20 reminds us of that, but he referred to it at different times throughout the history of the world. First, in the Garden of Eden, when he promised that the seed of the woman would, would crush the serpent's head. Later, it was foreshadowed through Moses and the deliverance of the people of Israel from slavery in the land of Egypt. And in, then in the wilderness, God instituted a system of sacrifice that would cover the sins of the people, a temporary solution to the sin problem. He then gave them what he called the feasts of the Lord. Note, not Israel's feasts or the Jewish feasts, but the feast of the Lord to commemorate important points along their journey, but also to point to Messiah who he would eventually send. Then he sent prophets who would Hundreds of years before Jesus came would herald the Messiah and give details about how he would come and who he would be and what he would do. But one of these commemorations or feasts of the Lord that God gave the people of Israel is Passover. And so today, I want us to just take a few moments and see Jesus, see the Messiah in the Passover 
because it is Passover, not Easter, that was celebrated by the early Christians. Maybe you didn't know that. Maybe you knew that, but, you know, sometimes we forget. But this is the truth. After the death and the resurrection of Jesus, which happened around these events of Passover that we'll be talking about today, Passover took on a whole new meaning for these new believers in Christ, most of whom were Jewish in those early days. And they continued to celebrate Passover, but now with new significance, understanding that it was all about the Messiah. It wasn't until 300 years after the death of Jesus that Easter appeared on the scene. And I don't have time to get into all the history today, but basically this came about because people couldn't agree, kind of like how we got church denominations. But let's be clear. What we celebrate as Easter was actually celebrated by the first Christians as Passover. Why? Well, because the events surrounding Jesus' death and resurrection happened around this feast of the Lord that the Jews and Jesus, who was Jewish, by the way, celebrated. So I want you to turn in your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 22, and we're going to read again together this account of Jesus and his disciples and their preparation for the Passover meal just before Jesus' crucifixion. I'm beginning to read at verse 7. You can follow along with me at home where you are, and uh, let's read together. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparation for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say... To the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found Jesus just, found things just as Jesus had told them. And so they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. Pesach is the Hebrew word for Passover. And as with uh, many of these things, we want to know what does the Hebrew word mean? What is the deep, rich meaning that is found here? Well, Pesach means literally to pass over. I know you thought it was going to be more amazing than that, but that's what it means, to pass over, to pass over. And so this was celebrated by the Jewish people since the time of the exodus from Egypt. And you will remember that the term Passover comes from the miraculous deliverance of the children of Israel who were slaves in the land of Egypt. And God spoke to Moses and he told him, go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. But Pharaoh wouldn't do it. He would say that they could go and then he would change his mind and God would send a plague on Egypt and momentarily again, Pharaoh would relent, but then harden his heart and change his mind again. This went on for nine different cycles and after nine plagues that God sent against the Egyptian people. Finally, God brought one more plague, the plague of the, the death of all the firstborn. But because of, of Pharaoh's hardness of heart before he sent the final plague because he wanted to protect his people. He instructed the Israelites to prepare a special meal and to ready themselves to leave the land, but not before they had taken the blood of a yearling lamb without defect and applied it to the door frames of their home. This would be a sign 
to the death angel who would pass over all of the homes with the blood applied to the door frames. Now that's a very quick history of how Passover came about. There were other instructions that included the slaughtering of lambs at twilight and eating the meat along with bitter herbs and with unleavened bread or bread made without yeast. And in Exodus 12, 25 to 27, we read this. When you enter the land, the Lord your God will give you as he promised. Observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, What does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. And so for centuries since the children of Israel have come to their promised land, this feast of the Lord was practiced to commemorate the deliverance of God's people from slavery of the Egyptians. And here in our text in Luke 22, Jesus and his disciples are celebrating this very event. The text says so. So much that Jesus says in verse 14, as they reclined at the table together, he says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Well, there are many elements uh, to a Jewish Seder or the Passover meal. And these have incredible significance when we think about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so what we celebrate today as communion is actually an abbreviated Seder. We're not going to have time to look at all of the elements of the Jewish Seder today, but I want to focus on just a few of them so that every time we take communion from now on, we will understand the beauty of how all of this fits together with our Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. John called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, and 8, Paul refers to Jesus in this way. He says, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread or the matzah of sincerity and truth. So picture Jesus and the disciples having their Passover meal together. The candles are lit and the blessing has been spoken. And then the first four cups of the Kedush Uh, The first four cups are are filled, and everyone joins in what is called the Kedush, okay? I have a cup here just for illustrative purposes. And the Kedush is the reciting of the blessing over the Shabbat meal or over a meal on another holy day like this one. And this first cup of the Seder has a name. It's called the Cup of Sanctification. And it's the one that's referred to in verse 17 of our text today. When Jesus takes the cup, it says, after taking the cup, he, Yeshua, gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. And we know from the tradition of the Seder that this is what Jesus would have said when he gave thanks. Baruch Ata Adonai. Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pri hagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And then he would go on and say, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life and preserved us and enabled us to reach this season. And so of the two cups that are mentioned in our text in the book of Luke, one in verse 17 and one in verse 20, this cup of sanctification, this first cup of the Seder, is what Jesus referred to here in verse 17. And after having sanctified the meal with the cup of sanctification, there are a couple of other Seder elements that happen, the washing of the hands, Uh, purification is an important part of Jewish tradition, and uh, how many of you know that is serving them very well in these common, uh, these circumstances that we're all experiencing together? The washing of the hands is so important. Uh, But it's a symbolic act of purification that prepares us to enter into the holiness of the feast. Many believe that it was at this time during the Seder that Jesus actually took it a step further and wrapped himself in a towel 
to wash the feet of his disciples. John 13, verses 4 and 5 says, So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. What a beautiful picture of servant leadership that we see as Jesus takes this this washing of hands and takes it to another level and washes the feet of his disciples. Then there was a few other elements, the dipping of parsley in salt water. Uh, Parsley is a symbol of life and new birth because it's, it's green and it's fresh, but also the salt water reminds us of the tears of slavery and the salt water of the Red Sea through which God brought the deliverance of the Jewish people. We've got no record of Jesus and his disciples doing some of these extra elements, but we know that they must have. This was the Passover after all. The gospel writers would not feel the need to recount every single step because this was a Jewish tradition that was well known and practiced by everyone for centuries. But I want to get to the next part, the breaking of of the middle matzah. You see, this is a mystery. Uh, Why, first of all, that they would use three matzahs? For at least 1,000 years before Yeshua was born, the Jewish rabbis had instructed the people to take three matzahs or pieces of unleavened bread and and wrap them in a linen bag. And and there are three compartments to the bag that they would use. I happen to have one here just so that I could show you. And they would take three pieces and put them in the bag. And rabbis have argued through the ages about why uh, there were three What is the significance of the three matzahs? Some said that they represent the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Others argued that they were representative of the prophets, Elijah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. But but now today, as we look back in light of the new covenant, we can see a perfect picture here, three matzahs, a picture of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, in this part of the Pesach Seder, The rabbi would take the middle matzah. This is, remember, before we knew anything about about Messiah. The rabbi would take the middle matzah out of the bag, and then he would remove it from the linen like I'm doing right now, and he he would break it. And so he would break the matzah, and then this broken middle matzah would be taken and wrapped back in the linen. This ritual is a mystery to the sages, but we can see that this is a symbol of the Son who was broken for us. And then we take, we wrap it back in the linen, and this, during the Seder, would be then hidden away. And I'm just going to hide it here under this pillow that uh, is used in the Seder. That piece of matzah is called the afikomen. Afikomen is a Greek word for that which comes after. And in the original context, this was used to to, uh, refer to uh, temporary redemption, but that one day God would send Mashiach or Messiah to come and redeem his people completely. Of course, we can see this as a symbol of the death, the, the broken matzah, and the burial the hidden matzah, the death and the burial of Messiah Yeshua. This point then, the leader would take the matzah and hold it up saying, this is the bread of affliction which our ancestors ate in the land of Egypt. Let all who are hungry enter and eat thereof. And all who are in distress come and celebrate this Passover. At present we celebrate it here, but next year we hope to celebrate it in the land of Israel. I'm just going to take another piece of matzah here so that we can talk a little bit about it because you see since before the days of Messiah the Jewish sages have commanded the very manner in which matzah is to be created. First they tell us that it needs to be uh, made or baked without leaven, that it must be flat and you can see that it's flat I think if you're looking on this angle. Also it must be burnt with stripes and pierced with holes. You can see the burn marks on the bread, and they they go in rows. They make stripes. And interestingly enough, they have a name for these burn marks. They call them the bruises. They call them the bruises. Now, if you look 
at the matzah for a moment. Let's, let's get these three things about it. The burn marks throughout the bread, they call the bruises. The bruises are in rows or they make stripes. You can see them horizontally this way, up and down this way. Probably hard for you to see, but there are perforations along each, underneath each of those rows, piercings that allow the, the heat to come up through the bread as it's baking and so that it will bake evenly. And so the bread is pierced in this way. Does this sound like anything at all to you? Well, to me, it sounds like the words of Isaiah 53 in verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions, or he was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Could there be a more perfect illustration of Messiah? Jesus is the middle matzah. He said, I am the bread of life. Interesting enough, this part of the Seder is not the part where we believe that Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. That comes later. There's lots more elements that uh, happen in a traditional uh, Seder. The second cup of instruction is filled. Another cup of wine would be filled. And at this point, there would be the telling of the Exodus story along with many other symbols that we don't have time to explain today. Maybe on another occasion we can cover that in a proper Seder dinner. But in the traditional Seder, after the story is told and the leader walks the people through the other symbols, the second cup, the cup of instruction, is drunk, and then the actual meal is served. The meal itself is also a very celebratory time. Picture one of your family gatherings, your family celebrations with joy and laughter and wonderful fellowship, and we can only assume that Jesus and his disciples enjoyed a complete meal together, likely with roasted lamb and other traditional foods eaten at Passover. And after the meal was over, and this is the part I want to get to this morning, the part after the meal, because in our text in Luke 22, in verse 19 and 20, it says that Jesus took bread and he broke it. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. So it's at this point in the Seder that the leader calls for the afikoman. Remember that hidden piece of matzah that we put over here? And uh, in the Seder, we get a child to come, and, and we make a, a game of it that, so that they can find the afikoman. And once it's found, uh, the child would take the hidden piece of matzah out from under the pillow, which incidentally has been, has been uh, called... For, for hundreds of years, even before Messiah came, has been called the stone. They called the pillow the stone. And so the child would take uh, the matzah out. He would remove or she would remove the broken pieces of matzah and then fold the cloth and return it to its hiding place back under the pillow or the stone. And then the leader would say a blessing and everyone would partake of the matzah together. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Malek HaOlam. Hamotzi lechem min haretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. As it's written, after the meal, Jesus blessed the bread. We just said the blessing together. And then he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take and eat. The afikoman is broken. It's wrapped in linen. It's buried. Later, it is brought back from its burial at this point in the Seder, just as Yeshua's body was broken and then buried, and then he rose from the dead. This is the point in our text where Jesus took the bread, the afikoman, and blessed it with the traditional blessing and gave it to the disciples. In their tradition, this middle matzah, or the afikoman, was different from the first matzah that represented their liberation from Egyptian exile. This piece that came after, that's what the Greek word means, to come, that which comes after. The afikoman, this piece that had been hidden away for later, represented Messiah who was to come to make our redemption complete. And it is this piece of bread that Jesus, in verse 19, breaks and gives to the disciples and says to them, this is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. What was he saying? 
He was basically saying to them, the Seder or Passover meal is no longer just about deliverance from Egypt. It's about the sacrifice that I, the perfect Lamb of God, will make for the forgiveness of all sin. When you do this in the future, what is this? The Seder. When you do this in the future, remember me. And so we have this powerful picture, the empty stone, the linen cloth being put back under the pillow or stone that has been that has been moved. This is a picture of the resurrected Yeshua, his grave clothes empty and the cloth that had covered his face set apart from the rest, neatly folded and the stone rolled away, not so he could get out. God didn't need to move the stone so Jesus could get out. Jesus was the resurrected Christ, amen? No, the stone was moved so that Mary and the disciples could get in and see that he is not here, he is risen, hallelujah. And so the world would know that Jesus had risen. Well, it's at this point in the Seder when the third cup now is filled. And so uh, we would fill the cup a third time. And this cup has a name as well. It's called the cup of redemption. We've had the cup of sanctification, the cup of instruction, and now the cup of redemption. And this cup is very aptly named because it's this cup that Jesus took after supper, Luke 22 and verse 20, and gave thanks and then gave it to his disciples saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. And so now the leader would say, I lift up the cup of redemption and call upon the name of the Lord. Praise and thanksgiving be to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who has provided the lamb for my redemption. Hallelujah. Amen. The blessing would be recited as we recited before, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu malach haolam, borei prihagafen. Lord, uh, blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And then they would drink the cup of redemption together. Matthew's account says this in Matthew 26, 27, and 28. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Notice, Luke says, it's poured out for you. Matthew says, it's poured out for many. Both are true. It is poured out for many, and it is poured out for you this morning. Yeshua's death on the cross so that, was so that we might have redemption. And so we see together that we in the church, what we have come to know as communion, what we will share in together today before we finish, is actually only two elements Two elements of a much more intricate feast given to the children of Israel as a feast of the Lord. And for hundreds of years, this feast of Passover was a celebration of God's deliverance from Egypt, but it was also filled with elements that looked ahead to the day when Messiah would come. Jesus, Yeshua, came to be sacrificed once and for all on Calvary. He is our Passover lamb. And as he shared this meal with his disciples on that day, you know, I wonder if they really caught the full significance of all that he was saying. Probably it took some time, but I think in the days that followed, they would put it all together. There's one last thing to conclude the Seder. It said that a prayer of thanks would be offered after the meal, and then they would partake of a fourth cup called the cup of acceptance the cup of acceptance. But Jesus didn't drink the fourth cup. He didn't drink the fourth cup. In Matthew's account, after Jesus shared what we now know was the cup of redemption, the third cup, Matthew says, I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Why didn't he drink it? He didn't drink it because it was not yet his time to be accepted. He still was about to be rejected in the very worst way. And he told the disciples that he would not drink of the fruit of the vine again until they were together in the Father's kingdom. And we know that one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, and together with Jesus in his kingdom, we can drink the cup of acceptance. The traditional Seder is then completed with the singing of a hymn, uh, the singing of psalms, and the drinking of this fourth cup together. We're told in verse 30 of Matthew 26 that when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. It's amazing, isn't it, to see the details, 
that fall into place when we understand exactly what it was that Jesus and the disciples were celebrating. From this meal, Jesus would take the disciples to Gethsemane where he would agonize over what was before him. He would pray to the Father and say, let this cup, now that's interesting language, isn't it? Let this cup pass from me. His cup of acceptance, the one that he didn't drink at the Seder, on this night would be to accept the Father's will, not my will, but yours be done. And we know what happened. He would be arrested, tried in a kangaroo court, deserted by his disciples who still didn't understand, and then crucified on a cruel cross. Lifted up for all to see, suffering for the sins of the world, sacrificed as our Passover lamb. He would die and be buried, but that was not the end. Amen? That was Friday. Sunday is coming. In a few moments, Pastor Chris will lead us in communion together, and I hope that today and after today, you will never think of communion again without understanding the intricacy of the plan of God from the very foundation of the world and through the history of the Jewish people to point to the Messiah, his son, Yeshua who would be sacrificed as the ultimate Passover lamb for the sins of all the people, for the sins of the world. Remember, his blood was poured out for many, but it was poured out for you. Father, thank you for the shed blood of our Savior Jesus. Thank you for our Passover lamb whose body was broken, whose blood was spilled so that we could have forgiveness of sins and life eternal. And Lord, if there's anyone who's listening today, who is watching today, who has not yet said yes to Jesus, not yet allowed Jesus to come into their hearts and into their lives and have uh, the blood of Christ wash them from all of their sins, Lord, I pray that today they would say a simple prayer, Lord Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life, forgive me, cleanse me of the wrong things I've done, and help me to live for you. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. And we thank you for your word today and for its encouragement to our hearts. Amen. Amen.